I'm going to gather us back together, a few people in the hall. I'm never in favor of penalizing prompt people, so if I'm the host this afternoon, we're going to stay on schedule. My name is Jim Schley. I'm pinch hitting for Partridge Boswell, who went away to Ireland this summer, but he's largely responsible for shaping the poetry programs, and he's the co-founder of Bookstock, and I want to acknowledge and thank him. Please silence your cell phones, any other devices that squeak or mutter, and um, the church has asked that we not have food or drink other than water in here, so keep that in mind. If you need a restroom, there's one straight through that door. There's also one through this door and two more downstairs. Um, Let's see. I want to thank the Yankee Bookshop, which is represented in the hallway by Gertrude. There are the readers in the poetry programs, which are all here today and tomorrow. Um, Their books are here. Um, Other books for other venues are sold elsewhere. If you're looking for something that you don't see, be sure and ask Gertrude. All the events this weekend are free. Um, Please look in your program, and if you notice a business whose proprietors you know, um, thank them for their support of Bookstock. And I want to mention the Bookstock's traditional sap bucket, which welcomes donations. They will be turned into syrup, as I said. I won't keep making that joke, but it is sure that that will be appreciated and put to good use. I'm going to do, um, I'm going to introduce James Cruz, who's going to read for about 20 minutes. Um, Then I'll introduce Garrett Kaiser, and the format for the afternoon will work that way. We'll save time at the end of each hour for some book signing, questions to the authors, and And, yeah. Oh, I'll just mention, just so you have it in mind, it is in your programs, but at 2 o'clock, we'll have Matthew Olsman and Rachel Haddas, and at 3 o'clock, we'll have Vivi Francis. So I invite you to spend your afternoon here. James Cruz was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. He is the author of two full-length collections of poetry, The Book of What Stays, um, which was won the Prairie Schooner Prize and also was a forward book of the year. And that's 2011, and Telling My Father, Cowles Prize, 2017. And five chapbooks, Bending the Knot, 100 Small Yellow Envelopes, What Has Not Yet Left, How Light Leaves, and Halfway Heaven. Chapbooks are a special form for poets. It's really like chamber music, if you think about it. They're intended to be read essentially at a sitting, and the work within a chapbook talks with itself, talks with the, the poems talk with one another in a different way than in a full length collection. Um, James is a regular contributor to the London Times Literary Supplement and also the editor of a an, recent anthology of poems, Healing the Divide, Poems of Kinship and Connection, which is published by Vermont's Green Writers Press this year. He holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and a PhD in writing and literature from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. He leads mindfulness and writing workshops um, and retreats throughout the country and works as a writing coach with groups and individuals. It's interesting to think about mindfulness in light of what Char was speaking about a moment ago of many-mindedness, or um, poets are often known even by their relatives, for mindlessness. So we might ask James about mindfulness in light of poetry. Um, James lives with his husband Brad Peacock in Shaftesbury, Vermont, which meant that he moved not so long ago from the Northern Plains to Northern New England. And as he's relocated, the weather and the intricate details of his poems have shifted and reoriented. You'll hear in his poems a remarkable flexibility and verve with pacing and the rhythms of speech, subtle and never over-emphatic, but also energized by a perception of where the drama of shared human experience resides and intensifies. Please welcome James Cruz.
Uh, thanks so much, Jim, and thanks to all of you for uh, being here today. So Jim mentioned the anthology that I recently edited, which is Healing the Divide, um, Poems of Kindness and Connection. And um, so I would like to read to you quite a bit from that. It's the project that is freshest for me. And then I'll read um, a little bit from um, my new work, especially around Vermont, and um, from my most recent collection, Telling My Father. Um, I've been traveling uh, to promote this book, Healing the Divide, and um, it came about after, um, maybe unsurprisingly, after the last election, when I just felt that um, kindness and connection uh, were more and more needed in um, our conversation, in our country, and poetry is the lens through which I see and process the world. So it felt like that could be my uh, small contribution to hopefully shifting things and healing that divide that I don't actually exist, that I don't believe actually exists between us, that it's mostly reinforced by, um, by the media. So I began to just look for poems that um, showed people coming together, helping each other out, or poems that talked about kindness. And um, one of the greatest examples was a poem by Danusha Lamaris, um, which quite amazingly right now is making the rounds on social media. So I think the last time I checked, it's been shared 50,000 times on Facebook. So she's enjoying a real wave of um, attention for this poem, very well deserved, um, as people pick up on this need to recognize those moments of small kindness between us. So this is called Small Kindnesses. <clears throat> I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by, or how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat, go ahead, you first. I like your hat. So in reading the comments about this poem, um, some of the people objected to being called honey. That was the one thing that they really didn't enjoy. You know, I don't really like being called honey, but otherwise I really enjoy the poem. Um, and so it's funny, the response. Um, one of my other uh, favorite poems from this is by Ellen Bass, a Western poet out of Santa Cruz. And um, I've been traveling a lot with this book, so I've spent a lot of time in airports. And I love any poem that uh, sees some positivity in, in an airport. So this one is called Gate C-22 by Ellen Bass. At Gate C-22 in the Portland airport, a man in a broadband leather hat kissed a woman arriving from Orange County. They kissed and kissed and kissed. Long after the other passengers clicked the handles of their carry-ons and wheeled briskly toward short-term parking, the couple stood there, arms wrapped around each other, like he'd just staggered off the boat at Ellis Island, like she'd been released at last from ICU, snapped out of a coma, survived bone cancer, made it down from Annapurna in only the clothes she was wearing. Neither of them was young. His beard was gray. She carried a few extra pounds you could imagine her saying she had to lose. 
But they kissed lavish kisses like the ocean in the early morning, the way it gathers and swells, sucking each rock under, swallowing it again and again. We were all watching, passengers waiting for the delayed flight to San Jose, the stewardesses, the pilots, the aproned woman icing Cinnabons, the man selling sunglasses. We couldn't look away. When <clears throat> we couldn't look away, we could taste the kisses crushed in our mouths, but the best part was his face. When he drew back and looked at her, his smile soft with wonder, almost as though he were a mother still open from giving birth, as your mother must have looked at you, no matter what happened after, if she beat you or left you or you're lonely now, you once lay there, the vernix not yet wiped off, and someone gazed at you as if you were the first sunrise seen from the earth. The whole wing of the airport hushed, all of us trying to slip into that woman's middle-aged body, her plaid Bermuda shorts, sleeveless blouse, glasses, little gold hoop earrings tilting our heads. So Chard mentioned um, in the previous reading um, the poet Lucille Clifton, who is such an amazing poet. Um, and I love this poem by her. It's called Blessing the Boats. And um, you see it shared around a lot. It's, it's this kind of blessing and feels appropriate for our times as well. So this is called Blessing the Boats by Lucille Clifton. May the tide that is entering even now, the lip of our understanding, carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind, then turn from it, certain that it will love you back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever, and may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. And so I'll read uh, the poem that, of my own that I included in here. And um, this is the, the title poem from my most recent collection. And um, this poem was kind of based in a little bit of regret. So my father passed away about um, 20 years ago now. And I never had a chance to come out to him before he passed. And I sort of carried around this regret and guilt about that for a while. And, um, you know, very slowly people kind of give you this wisdom and, you know, most people would say to me, I think he already knew. And so I began to think about these moments of connection that we had when he found subtle ways of letting me know that he knew I was gay. And so um, this was one of those moments. It's called Telling My Father. I found him on the porch that morning sipping cold coffee, watching a crow dip down from the power line into the pile of black bags stuffed in the dumpster, where he pecked and snagged a can tab, then carried it off, clamped in his beak like the key to a room only he knew about. My father turned to me then, taking in the reek of my smoke traces of last night's eyeliner, I decided not to wipe off this time. Out late was all he said, and then smiled, rubbing the small of my back through the robe for a while, before heading inside, letting the storm door click softly shut behind him. Later, when I stepped into the kitchen again, I saw it waiting there, on the table, a glass of orange juice he had poured for me and left sweating in a patch of sunlight so bright I couldn't touch it at first. So um, 
I'll read a few more about um, my father and um, just kind of thinking about this kindness theme. You know, when uh, my father had hepatitis C, that was what he passed away from. And, um, you know, when you're taking care of someone who's ill, you do your best to be kind and you do what you think is best for them instead of what they feel is best for them. And so um, I was very strict about trying to keep him on this salt-free diet um, that the doctor had recommended and um, sort of saw eventually that that was a losing battle. So this one is called Strict Diet. Though the doctors said no salt, salt was all my father craved. His body bloated, skin waterlogged and gray. Still, he wanted potato chips, honey-baked ham, greasy slabs of Polish sausage from Pikatowski's deli. He begged for pepperoni pizza, garlic butter, ribs slathered in sauce. But when I did the shopping, I searched only for labels that said low sodium and no preservatives, instead bringing home heads of broccoli, turkey burgers, shredded wheat. My poor father. <laughs> and when he died anyway, guilt gnawed me like an ulcer. How could I have denied him his few final pleasures? Until I found Big Mac wrappers stuffed under the car seat, jars of pickles in the hall closet, true, and hidden among wads of tissues near the nightstand, his stash, a half-used canister of salt. I sat down on his sagging mattress, now stripped of stained sheets, and studied that blue label with the girl in the yellow dress holding her umbrella against a rain of salt still falling from the sky. And so um, this next one is also about him. And um, for some reason, I always, when, it, when it's summer comes around and um, I now live on uh, part of an organic farm with my husband and the tomatoes start coming in, I always think of him because he loved tomatoes so much. And so this next one is called Halfway Heaven. Before he died, my father tried to teach me the only language of manhood he knew. Phillips head, needle nose, catalytic converter. But I left him hunched under hoods or sprawled on cardboard pallets beneath stalled cars, thinking the dust of books and the glow of computer screens would keep me from work like that. I hated his oil stink, the orange goop he used to clean his grease-black hands, and those homemade tattoos of lightning on his biceps. I hated the cigarette dangling from his lips, his eyes squinting against smoke snaking up as he scraped a deer skull clean of meat for mounting. But now I want it all back. I replay every scene in my mind as if seeing my father again could keep him alive and tinkering in some other realm, some halfway heaven he'd love because everything needs fixing there. I think of the green striped tube socks pulled to his knees when he mowed the yard, the scratch of sandpaper stubble against my cheek each time he kissed me goodnight. I still hear the way he'd say sorta speak when he meant so to speak, while explaining, for instance, why tomatoes taste better with a kiss of salt, brings out the sweetness, he'd say, sorta speak. So I often say that Vermont is one of the best places, if not the best place, to be a poet. Um, the landscape itself, the so slower pace of life, um, seem to lend themselves to writing poetry. And um, it just seems like people appreciate poetry more here. And um, 
I'm lucky enough to be married to a farmer. And um, so this poem came out of that experience when I kind of realized that um, I am one, one in a line of people um, who have kind of held this same position. So this is called Spring Ritual. When he rises from bed with a sigh and rubs his aching shoulders and thighs, I know the sheets will smell of tiger balm for weeks. But as I pry open that small jar with the gold lid, the sudden camphor scent makes me squint in the dim lamplight until I see a line of farmers stretching out behind him and around us, filling the room. Generations pulling on patched overalls and poorly mended jeans, thin coats reeking of tobacco and sweat, the same ones they wear each spring. Then it dawns on me, until the end of summer, most of his attention will go into rows of freshly tilled soil and beds of greenhouses, where the purple trumpets of eggplant flowers already peek out from behind the vines. This is as it should be and as it has been for hundreds of years. Even as I work the balm into his back, I can see his, an I can see his hands itching to start the tractor and run a rock picker through these fields. I can see him kneeling in the earth at the end of a 10 hour work day and rubbing between his fingers the fragrant leaves of a basil plant that would not be living without him. And so I think I'll read just one more. Uh, thank you so much for your attention today. And um, this one, you know, I, I often don't read this poem in other places because I feel like it's such a Vermont poem and um, maybe even a Northeast poem, but people other places don't always get this. So this one is called Neighbors. Where I'm from, people still wave to each other, and if someone doesn't, you might say of her, she wouldn't wave at you to save her life, but you try anyway, give her a smile. This is just one of the many ways we take care of one another. Say, I see you, I feel you, I know you are real. I wave to Rick who picks up litter while walking his black labs, olive and basil, hauling donut boxes, cigarette packs, and countless beer cans out of the brush beside the road. I say hello to Christy, who leaves almond croissants in our mailbox and mason jars of fresh pressed apple cider on our side porch. I stop to check in on my mother-in-law, more like a second mother, who buys us toothpaste when it's on sale and calls if an unfamiliar car is parked at our house. We are going to have to return to this way of life, this giving without expectation, this loving without conditions. We need to stand eye to eye again and keep asking no matter how busy, how are you, how's your wife, how's your knee, making this talk we insist on calling small, though kindness is what keeps us alive. Thank you all so much.